Well, this morning, our scripture text passage is really quite brief, but as you know, it's one of our more familiar passages and one that is full of um, very useful instruction. Uh, I'd like to read for you the text as we begin in John chapter 21. We're going to be, (coughs) excuse me, looking at verses 15 through 17. John 21, beginning in verse 15. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our understanding this morning and to our edification. Now, just a reminder about last time. Uh, We were looking at Jesus' third appearance to seven of His disciples as they were fishing uh, on the Sea of Galilee. They had fished all night, but in God's providence had caught nothing. Now, remember we looked at the fact that they weren't doing anything wrong. It's not that they weren't supposed to be fishing. It wasn't that, that they had gone back to doing what they were doing before, forgetting everything they had just gone through for the last several years. After Jesus' death... They didn't have the, the, the means of support that they had before. Remember, the, there were women of means who were following Jesus and were supporting the disciples and others as well. But now Jesus had died. He had risen again. This was the third time He was appearing to them, but they didn't have the situation they had before. Now they had to provide for their own means, and so they were going back to fishing in order to do that. Now, having fished all night, they came up short, and we also saw there was a reason for that. And that was that Jesus might again reveal His love and His care for His disciples to show them that He was still with them and He would still provide for them. Now, not only did He bless them with many fish, uh, and the fish were actually counted, uh, and large fish, to take care of their current needs, but it was also to provide them for the means that they were going to shortly uh, have. Uh, They they were going to need the resources to be able to travel to Jerusalem, where they would, well, which they would shortly do, is they would wait for the Holy Spirit. So Jesus allowed them this catch to provide for them in these two different ways. And remember that our Lord Jesus also continued to show His care and concern and His servanthood as when they came to shore, He had already prepared a meal for them of fish and bread, and He, he served them. Uh, our Lord now, who had moved from His state of humiliation, you know, His having humbled Himself and even to the point of death, and He was under the power of death for three days, now was beginning His state of exaltation, but even in His state of exaltation is still a servant. And that reminded us that when the Lord gives us authority... That authority is not to lord it over others, but rather to minister to those under our authority to serve them. But now we see here in this particular text another reason for Jesus' appearance, and that is that there was still some outstanding business that He had to take care of with Peter that, quite honestly, had to do with His previous denials of our Lord Jesus. Now, we've already noted, and we would certainly assume, because we know our Lord, especially as we have the <clears throat> Scriptures to tell us what He's like, Peter knew that Jesus still loved him. He still cared about him. When Jesus appeared to the ten and then to the eleven, He received and He embraced all of them. He didn't leave Peter out. He included Peter. But there still was some question, mainly in, I mean, it was actually only in Peter's mind, maybe in the disciples' mind as to where Peter actually stood with his Lord now, and maybe a question about his future usefulness in his kingdom. I say, at least in Peter's mind, there was no question in Jesus' mind, obviously. And certainly, when we fall into sin, 
there is a question in our own minds as to whether or not God is going to forgive us and whether He still will use us after we have sinned. Well, Jesus answers that question in Peter's mind and in our own minds to show us that there is forgiveness and that the Lord still intends to use us, even as He still intended to use Peter in the work of His kingdom after His fall and His repentance. So let's look at a few things from this text. First of all, let's take a look at when the conversation takes place because I think, again, it shows us Jesus' concern, His care, His love for Peter. It was after they had finished their meal. Jesus has the perfect timing, okay? We read in verse 15, so when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, Jesus is the perfect host. Jesus is always perfectly considerate. Jesus knew that what he had to say to Peter would likely make Peter a bit uneasy. So he didn't speak to Peter before the meal. He didn't speak to him during the meal, but he spoke to him when the, the meal was finished so that he wouldn't spoil the meal for Peter uh, or for the other disciples or make Peter uncomfortable. Jesus is the perfect host, very considerate. Now, as I've already mentioned, Peter had seen the Lord twice already, and both times Jesus had received him, and Jesus had not rebuked him. But Peter still knew that there was something between them because he had denied him three times. And Peter did not take this lightly. Peter did not trade on the grace of God. Peter knew what he deserved for having done this, what we all deserve when we sin. We don't deserve grace and mercy. That's something God gives to us freely that we don't deserve. What we deserve for our sins, actually what the Westminster Confession also reminds us is that we deserve what sin deserves. That's what we deserve every time we sin, and we should never see it any differently than that. We should sense the guilt of that and the condemnation, well, not the condemnation. The Lord has freed us from that. But we should know what it deserves. It's a means to kind of keep us from doing those things in the first place and not sinning so that grace might abound. Peter knew what he deserved. He deserved to be removed, especially from Jesus' close circle of friends. I mean, essentially what Peter would deserve ultimately for the denial of the Lord Jesus Christ is what Jesus said on an earlier occasion that we would deserve if we denied him. If you deny me, I will deny you. Of course, in that instance, what he means is somebody who really never loved him in the first place. Sometimes we do grow weak, and we can deny the Lord like Peter did. It's not exactly the same thing. But remember, that is what we would deserve, but for the grace of God. Well, he knew what he deserved, but so far, he had not said anything to Jesus, and Jesus had not said anything to him and it's quite likely Peter did not really know where he stood with Jesus. Certainly he hoped for the best since Jesus had embraced him and received him. But he was still afraid that Jesus was yet to deal with him. Now, Jesus, again, out of his love and mercy, did not leave Peter in the dark. He did not leave him doubting. It would have been cruel to leave him in that situation. And so what we see taking place here is our Lord clearing the air in His mercy by telling Peter he still has a place among the disciples. He was still going to use him to care for his flock. Now, Jesus didn't speak to Peter on his first appearance. He didn't speak to him in his second appearance. I think our Lord was giving Peter time to think about what it was he had done. And we do need to understand that sometimes the Lord will withdraw perhaps a short distance to allow us time to reflect on our sins, to learn from our sins, to be humbled by our sins before He breaks in with His love and His mercy, which He will ultimately do if we are His children. Now, we should note that while Peter was kicking himself for his failure to stand up for his Lord during his time of suffering, the way that Jesus deals with him is, is far from severe. He never scolded him for what he had done. He never even spoke directly to him about what he had done. And even when he comes to deal with him, he's going to speak about it indirectly in a very encouraging way since our Lord knew what was in Peter's heart. And he knew 
that Peter had repented. He didn't have to hear it from him. He didn't even have to see it from him because he knew the hearts of all men. Uh, he knew, um, well, he knew Peter had repented. Again, when he speaks to him, it's not only to let him know that he had forgiven him, but Jesus wanted to reaffirm his love for him. So here, Jesus shows us his continuing love towards those who are his, towards us. When we fall into sin, that he, and ultimately this work, remember, in the heart of Peter was the work of our Lord, wasn't it? He told Peter he was going to deny him, but he also said to Peter, I have prayed for you. And when you turn, strengthen the brethren. When we fall into sin, we need to understand Jesus prays for us. In order to bring us to repentance, in order to restore us. So this is what this is showing us, but it also shows us, by the way, by way of example, what it is that we should be doing for others. Our willingness to restore brothers and sisters that fall into sin. And by the way, we, we should also note from this example to do it in the way that Jesus does. I mean, the way that he treated Peter, because Peter was truly a child of his, was in gentleness, the way he dealt with it, not directly, not my way of strong rebuke, although sometimes maybe that's necessary, but he does it by way of gentleness because he, had, he knew that Peter had already repented. Well, secondly, we see the questions that Jesus asked Peter to draw that repentance, as it were, out of him. He asked Peter three times whether or not he loves him, and Peter answers three times that he does. But there's just a bit of variation between the three questions. So let's just take a look, first of all, at Jesus' questions to Peter. Jesus asked the first time, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, it's interesting that when Jesus addresses Peter, that he doesn't call him Peter, but he calls him Simon, son of John, which is basically Simon Barjona, which is what Peter's name was. Now, remember that Jesus is the one that gave Peter the name Peter. He named him Peter, which means, you know, a stone or a rock. And Cephas essentially means the same thing, just two different languages, one Aramaic, the other in, in the Greek. Now, Simon is, again, his, his given name. It was the name given to him by his family that he grew up with, is the name that Jesus called him by when he was going to face Satan's temptation. Now, that was another interesting thing. We read in Luke 22, verse 31, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. He doesn't call him Peter here either. And the reason being is because Peter basically, under these circumstances, as we've already seen, because he, he was sifted and he denied his Lord. Peter had lost that Stability. He had lost that strength that essentially was characterized by that name Peter, rock or stone. Now, Jesus didn't take his name away from him. He said, you will no longer be called Peter because you fell into sin. But he doesn't use the name Peter because Peter basically had, had buckled and he had fallen. So there's an indication, even in the way Jesus is addressing him, that there has been a failure. But it's not, again, it's not severe. And he hasn't changed anything. But again, he's just calling him by another name other than the one that actually represents stability. So he calls him, he asks him, do you love me more than these? Now we know that it's in our Lord's heart to call Peter back into the work. But before he calls him back into the work, he first of all asks him the most basic question that can be asked for anyone who would serve the Lord. And one that would show whether or not he genuinely belonged to him or not, and that is whether or not he loved him. This is also what must be there before Peter could ever possibly serve the Lord as he should. He must love the Lord. Now, there's obviously another reason why Jesus asked him this question, and that is because Peter had denied him. And now he's questioning him, do you really love me, Peter? How can you say that you love me, Peter, when just a short time ago, you denied three times that you even knew me. Now, again, when we do things that are the opposite of what we say we believe, and Peter certainly 
profess to believe and, and to love the Lord Jesus Christ, when we do things that are the opposite of what we believe, we shouldn't take offense if somebody questions our sincerity and whether or not we really do love the Lord or we really, whether we really do believe what we say we believe if we see that, well, if they see that we're acting in a way that is contrary to what we say we believe. So there shouldn't be an offense taken here. We should expect it. But I want you to notice again Jesus' gentleness in dealing with this question. He didn't say to Peter, Peter, you don't love me. I mean, look at what you did. He asked the question, do you love me? And remember, Jesus knew that Peter really did love him. But he deals with him again indirectly, and sometimes that's the best way to deal with it is indirectly rather than just directly. Now, the question that Jesus asked Peter is interesting on another level because he didn't ask Peter, Peter, have you, have you wept over your sin? Have you been fasting, Peter? Have you been trying to make amends by doing lots of good things, the things you know that I want you to do? But he asks him the most important question, do you love me? As if he's saying to Peter, if you love me, Peter, that's all that matters. Then everything you've done has been forgiven, and we won't say anything more about it. Because we can't make up for what we've done. There's no way. It doesn't matter what we might do to try to make up to the Lord what we've done. We cannot make it up. All that really matters is whether or not we love Him. Because if we love Him, we are forgiven. So that is the important question that He asked. Remember when Jesus told Simon the Pharisee that the woman who was washing His feet with her tears and drying them with her hair was forgiven? And he didn't say that she was forgiven because she was crying a lot, because it, it looked like she was repentant or because of the good work that she was doing, but she was forgiven because she loved much. Remember, that's what Jesus pointed to. The actions just simply demonstrated that she really did love the Lord. Now, again, if you love the Lord, it doesn't matter what you have done. You are forgiven if you have repented of those things. As a matter of fact, your love for Him is the evidence that you are forgiven because you wouldn't have that love if you didn't have the grace of God in your heart. If you love the Lord, it shows that He has had mercy upon you. By the way, if you love the Lord, remember, let's not forget, you will keep His commandments too. Repentance means turning away from what you're doing that is unloving and beginning to do what is loving in His eyes. But it was also important that Peter love him because of what the Lord was actually calling Peter to do, and that is to take care of his sheep. So it was important because of Peter's former denials. It was important because it is the evidence that he is forgiven and he really belongs to the Lord. But it was also important because Jesus is now going to recommission Peter to do what he originally called him to do, and that is to shepherd his sheep. Jesus is only going to entrust the care of His people to those who really love Him, because if they love Him, they will love what belongs to Him. They will love His people. You really can't love one without the other. If you love the Lord, you'll love His people. If you don't love His people, you don't love the Lord. There is that kind of a relationship between them. But Jesus would particularly have those who are going to shepherd His sheep love Him, because if they love Him, they will love and take care of His sheep. So the same thing obviously is true of us. We need to make sure that we love the Lord Jesus because if we don't, we're never going to love His people. If we don't love the Lord, we're never going to be able to do what Jesus tells us to do as members of the congregation, which is that we are to love one another in the way that Jesus has loved us. That was His commandment to His disciples in the upper room discourse prior to His uh, crucifixion. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. But now there's a couple other things we need to note here. Jesus, or yes, Jesus doesn't merely ask Peter whether he loves him, but he asks this question, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, if you stop and think about this for a minute, that can mean a few different things. It can mean... Well, at least three things, but Jesus could be asking this question, do you love me, Peter, more than you love these others? Do you love me more than James and John? 
Do you love me more than Andrew, your brother? Now, we don't love Jesus as much as we should if we do not love Him far more than our most intimate friends, the people we love the most in this world. On one occasion, Jesus said to the crowd that was following Him in Luke 14, verses 26 to 27, something we really couldn't understand unless we understood this principle. Jesus said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Our love for others is to be so, such a distant second that our love for them would almost be characterized, as Jesus says, by hatred rather than by love. Now, we know that He doesn't call us to hate those who are closest to us, who are even to love our enemies. We're not to hate anyone. What He means is our love for Him is to be so surpassing in every way to those who would be the closest to us that there's, there's no comparison. And if we had to choose between the two of them, we'll take Jesus every time. Well, that's one thing that uh, Jesus could have meant. Another is, do you love me more than these things that that you had given your life to, Peter? Uh, do you love me more than these boats and these nets and the pleasure you get from fishing, if there actually is any pleasure in fishing? Some people do find pleasure in it. Uh, more than you gain by fishing? Are you willing to leave all of this behind in order to do what I'm calling you to do? Well, is there anything that you love more than Jesus? Are you willing to do what the rich young ruler could not do, which was sell all you possess and give to the poor and follow Jesus? You see, Jesus says we have to love Him more than these. That was where the rich young ruler failed. He loved his riches. He couldn't give them up. And so he failed in his love for Christ. He was not forgiven uh, unless he repented at some later date, but he left you know, uh, downcast because he was one who had great possessions, and those possessions had possession of him. We have to love Jesus more than our possessions. But Jesus could have also been asking Peter, and I think this is probably what he had in mind here, do you love me more than these love me? Now, why would, why would Jesus ask that question? Well, remember before Jesus was betrayed, before he was betrayed by Judas, handed over to his enemies. He said to his disciples in Matthew 26, verses 31 and 32, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. And of course, when they said that, all the disciples were probably stunned. But there was one who spoke up, and that was Peter. And how did Peter respond? Verse 33, even though all may fall away because of you, and he was referring to all the other disciples, I will never fall away. Now, what was Peter actually saying here? Peter was saying, I love you more than these. I will stand, even though all the rest of them fall. Now, Jesus, I believe, is asking Peter here, Peter, do you still believe that? Do you still believe that that's true? Well, Peter respond, or his response indicates that he really no longer believed that because obviously he had been tremendously humbled when he answers in verse 15, you know that I love you. Not that you know that I love you more than these, but you know that I love you, Lord. Now again, the most important thing is that we love Jesus. He will accept us if we love Him, even if there are others who love Him more we don't have to love Him most to be accepted by the Lord. I mean, that is more than other people. But we do need to love Him. Okay, we do need to love Him. Now, this brings us to our third point, and that is how Peter answers Jesus' questions. Jesus asked Peter this question three times, and Peter responds essentially the same way three times. We read in verse 15, he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he says the same thing in verses 16 and 17. Now, we've just seen that Peter no longer believes himself to love Jesus more than the other disciples, and now he appears to be ashamed of what he had boasted of earlier 
Um, and we should all be ashamed, of course, by any measure of pride within us. We know that it's only by the grace of God that we love Him at all, and we should never seek uh, to think that we love Him more than others. Now, again, we do need, according to what our Lord tells us, our goal and actually what our experience should be is that we should love Jesus most of all. We should love Him more than brothers and sisters in the Lord, brothers and sisters in our families, our closest relations. But we must always believe that our brothers and sisters in the Lord love Jesus more than we do. Now, that is kind of an interesting thing, isn't it? And why would, we, why would I say that? Well, you know, Jesus is asking Peter this question, Peter, do you still believe you love me more than the rest of these? And Peter might have thought he did before, but now he understands his own weakness. He understands the deceitfulness of his own heart. He understands his, his sin, and he's not going to say that anymore. And how can we really think any other way than what Peter thinks? Because don't we know the weakness of our own hearts? Don't we know our own sins? But we don't know the sins of others. So how can we say we love Jesus more than they do when we know our hearts, but we don't know their hearts? We may very well love Him more, but we should never think that. And to think so would be boasting. Uh, we just need to focus on our love for the Lord and not concern ourselves with whether we love them more than our neighbor. We should, of course, try to do what we can to encourage our neighbors to love them more, but we must always think better. Try to outdo one another in showing honor to one another, thinking the best and thinking more highly of others than of ourselves. But even though he no longer believes that he loves Jesus more than his brothers, he still professes his love to him and to be devoted to him, which is the evidence of his repentance. Remember I told you earlier Jesus had prayed before Peter fell into the sin that his faith would not fail. And the Father answered that prayer, and because his faith didn't fail, neither did his love for Jesus fail, because remember, genuine faith works by love. That's what the Apostle Paul tells us. Love is what energizes faith. It's actually, when you, when you get down into it, it's what gives birth to faith. The Spirit of God, that is His fruit that He produces in our hearts. He creates a love for the Lord, and as soon as that love is there, we reach out in faith and embrace the one now whom we love. Faith works by love. If you have faith, you have love. Peter, or Jesus prayed that Peter's faith would not fail, and it didn't fail, which means He still loved him. Now, Jesus answers uh, or questions Peter three times with regard to His love, and each time Peter professes His love. And that love that he professed, as we know from the historical account that follows, proved to be genuine. It moved him to devote his whole life to Jesus and to follow Him, even though it meant that he would be executed for that. That's what we're going to see a little bit this evening. But one thing we do want to take notice of here is that when Jesus asked Peter the third time whether he loves him, we read in verse 17. Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? Now, you, I think you all know the answer to these questions. Was he grieved because Jesus asked him this question three times? Did you accept my, my answer the first time, why, or the first time, the second time? Why are you asking me three times? Was it because asking him three times reminded him of the three times he had denied his Lord? Well, it's possible it had, that had something to do with it, and I'm sure it did, but... It's more likely he was grieved because of the change in the question the third time, which obviously doesn't appear in our English translations. The first two times, Jesus uses the word agape, which, as you know, is the highest, most adoring, most self-sacrificing kind of love that, that anyone can experience, and that's the kind of love, of course, the Lord gives to us. When Jesus says, Peter, do you love me with this kind of love? Each, the first two times, well, actually each time, but the first two times, Peter responds using the word phileo, which means I'm fond of you, Lord. You're, you're like a brother to me. <laughs> it, it's, it's a lesser kind of love. It's not answering up to that, to that question that Jesus had asked. But when Jesus asked the question the third time, he uses the word that Peter had used. He uses the word phileo calling into question whether or not Peter loved him even to that degree. And that 
is why he was grieved. But notice in the last answer, Peter appeals to the fact that Jesus knows this to be true. We read in verse 17, and he said to him, that as Peter says to the Lord, Lord, you know all things, you know that I love you. The fact that Jesus knows all things and that he sees what's going on in our hearts is really quite a blessing to us. It may threaten those who really don't know the Lord because they know, or He knows, what's going on in their hearts. They can't hide this from Him. There's, there's nothing we can hide from the Lord. Don't even try. Just, you know, be open and confess. But it's a comfort to those of us who do love Him because even though we know our lives don't measure up to what they should be, to what He calls us to be, we know that He still sees that we love Him and He still forgives us, and He still receives us. Now, finally, we see the commission that Jesus gives to Peter, and, and this has to come at the end of, of confirming His love. Jesus now commissions Peter to care for His church, for those whom He purchased with His own blood, to care for the young and the immature lambs and those that have grown to maturity. He says in verse 15, "'Tend my lambs.'" In verse 16, shepherd my sheep. In verse 17, tend my sheep. Jesus was calling Peter to feed his people, to feed the young and the old, with the milk of his word, with the meat of his, his word, with his gospel, and to do the work of a shepherd among them. Remember how the Lord called David out of the sheepfolds to shepherd his people Israel, and he called him because he knew what it was to shepherd, how to care for sheep. And uh, he's calling uh, Peter to do exactly the same kind of work here, the work of a shepherd, to care for them, to protect them, to guide them in all the ways of God's blessing. When Jesus ascended into heaven, He gave gifts to men, Paul tells us, and one of these gifts were, was, was the gift of elders, pastors, teachers, to be the means of basically helping the flock grow up into the image of their Lord and to serve Him in His kingdom. That's what Jesus is calling Peter to do. Now, why did Jesus single Peter out to do this? Why did Jesus give him this commission? Was it because He was intending for Peter now to be basically the, the earthly head of His church, as, as some believe? Well, no. Peter didn't actually see his commission in this way. This wasn't a, a call to be to like a super office above the rest. Peter was just happy to be called back to the work he was originally being called to. And I think that's the way that Peter saw this. Peter never understood the commission in, in the way that he would be head and shoulders, as it were, above the rest or the head of the rest. And he never claimed this authority. As a matter of fact, on one occasion, we even see him called on the carpet for his activities, going out and sharing the gospel with Gentiles. Peter, were you out of your mind? Um, so Peter was not, who are you to question me? But he was simply expressed what the Lord had shown him, and they accepted that answer, and they said, well, then the Lord has, has brought Gentiles also into His kingdom. What Jesus was doing was restoring Peter after his fall and his repentance to the apostleship to which He had originally called him in a way that both He and His fellow disciples would know that this is the Lord's will. Let's not forget Peter had fallen into a very serious sin. We don't want to take this lightly, and neither did Peter, but it didn't mean that his usefulness was over. Jesus forgave him, and he still entrusted to him that which was most precious to him, his church. Tend my lambs, shepherd my sheep. When we fall into sin, as I've said, and this, this is really, again, I think the most encouraging part of this, when we fall into sin, the Lord doesn't throw us away. He doesn't cast us out. He doesn't say, I'm done with you. You might as well just leave. He never throws us out of His family. The Lord Jesus always works to bring us back to the place where He can use us again. And the reason is, and the only reason, is because He loves us. That is, if we have trusted Him. Now, this was true before we came to the Lord Jesus Christ. He loved us. Why did we ever turn away from our sins in the first place and put our trust in Him? The only reason why 
we sought the Lord in the first place is because He was seeking us. We love Him because He first loved us. And now that He has found us, now that we've been reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, is He ever going to reject us? Is He ever going to cast us away? Well, Paul tells us there's nothing in heaven and earth that can separate us from Him. There's nothing that can take us away from the Father's hand. Uh, the parable of the lost coin of the lost sheep tells us that Jesus will always go after one that belongs to Him if they stray from the fold, and He will always bring them back. And when He brings us back, He brings us back to a place of usefulness in His church because He loves us. Will Jesus forgive us if we fall into sin? He will if we repent. He will restore us. That is what His love is like toward us, and that is the only reason why you and I will ever make it to heaven. It's not because of our faithfulness, it's because of His faithfulness, but of course His faithfulness toward us will be reflected by our faithfulness toward Him. Our turning back to Him and continuing with Him is simply the evidence that He is working, seeking us. And again, this is what we should be doing for one another as well when we fall into sin. And for those who are outside the church who have never repented of sin, we should try to bring them into reconciliation with the Lord and to a place of usefulness. So let me just say in closing, if you do not know Him this morning, if there's anyone here who hasn't trusted Him, then seek the Lord for His mercy and His grace. If you do that, you will find that the Lord is actually seeking after you. The Lord calls you to come, and He welcomes you to come. He commands you to come, and He tells you that if you do come, He won't turn you away. He won't cast out anyone who comes to Him. He will receive you. And for the rest of us, again, who know the Lord, if you do know Him, let's prepare to meet Him now at His table. Jesus loves you. And He wants to strengthen you, and He wants to encourage you to hold firm to His paths that you might do His will and be blessed. And He also wants you to know that if you have fallen into sin, He is willing and ready to forgive you if you will simply turn from that sin. And you will turn from it if you do know Him. He will make sure that you do. Well, let's, let's spend a few moments in prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us take what we've just heard and apply it and use it also to prepare to come to the table, remembering that the table is for those who have repented and have trusted in the Lord Jesus. The table is for those who really want to be free from all of their sins. The table is for those who love the Lord Jesus Christ and have been forgiven by Him. And the table is also a place where we can find more strength to serve and honor our Lord. Let's, let's spend a few moments in 